when I read the character Agent 99, I didn't audition for it, but I just read the script. I, I loved her outfit. She was wearing a chauffeur's outfit, and I thought that was really cool. And um, she, her attitude in it uh, was an interesting one because she was approaching this rather bumbling uh, partner of hers, but really in a very gentle way. And I felt really comfortable with her and her attitude. Uh, toward the man she was interested in, I guess. And it was also a fun kind of um, conceit, you know, that he wouldn't know she was a girl until she took her cap off and her hair fell down. Well, you know, 99 never thought Max was dumb. You know, she sort of rolled her eyes from time to time at some of the things that he did. But I think that she so worshipped him that any negativity just got sort of swept under the carpet and she could just go on with this complete adoration of him. I think that I, I, certainly in the first year of Get Smart, that would have been beyond her wildest dreams that Max would ever actually marry her. He wasn't even acknowledging her as his girlfriend. Um, and I think by the time it came around, uh, the character uh, probably was quite ready for it, and she had uh, sort of aced the situation, I think. Uh, for me, as an actress, I realized very pragmatically that it was very important for them to get married to uh, lift the ratings in the, was it the fourth year? It kept the show going, I think, uh, you know, added a little shot of adrenaline to the show. And uh, also, it gave me an opportunity <laughs> to wear one of the most bizarre uh, wedding outfits that you've probably seen on television. I think the reason the 99 came off the way she did, and uh, the, with the sort of softness in her character, was because Max was so um, staccato that it almost seemed right, almost in a musical sense, that she would, she would do the soft thing, he would do the hard thing. And I, I think that we had no idea when the show began that that's the way it would be, but it was that way from the very first time that we were on screen together. We had barely met the first day. And I think we said hello, and that was it. And then we stood on our marks, and we did our first scenes together. And uh, f from, f from the very beginning, it was like that. Uh, it was her way of handling that kind of personality. And it was also, of course, the way she was written. And, um, and I think it was partly my attitude at the time toward men. I mean, I grew up at a time when you handled men carefully, and it was not done in a, in a kind of um, manipulative way at all, although it was manipulative. I, it was done because that's the way men were, and that's the way women were, and men strutted around. <laughs> and. Um, you know, tripped over their own two feet, sort of like Dagwood Bumstead kind of image. And women were very adoring of the guy they saw inside that um, bungling character. And so I think it came very naturally to, uh, to respond to him that way. And it was just at the beginning of the women's movement, maybe just predating it a bit, I, I think that um, Betty Friedan's book had just been written or had not yet been published. And so there was no anger in the scripts or in the air or in you know, the atmosphere of the times uh, that later on, I think, crept into scripts where, where the female characters were a little more defensive and a little more aggressive and you know, uh, staking out their territory and their consciousness was a bit more raised. I didn't think that Agent 99 was groundbreaking at the time. It, it, what was, it just seemed very traditional at the time for this woman to be acting this way with this man. I kind of ignored the fact that she was so good at what she did and she was ranked so highly in the organization. That didn't really land on me at the time. I mean, later on, a lot of women have said to me, that they were so influenced by Agent 99. They were, uh, she was a great role model for them. But at the time, I, I didn't even think about that. Uh, it was more, my job as an actor was much more relating to his character. 
in the way she did. And I didn't really analyze the fact that, wow, she's really something pretty special. I don't think women thought they were anything particularly special. And like, oh, well, yeah, she has that rank, but let's focus on him again. So I think that, in, I think that the person who was more conscious of that was Buck Henry and, of course, Mel Brooks when they wrote this character. And I'm not even sure if they were conscious that they were doing it. Because artists always kind of preempt what's coming next. And uh, they were presaging uh, the women's movement at that time when it was just an incipient uh, sort of blip in our consciousness. And uh, I don't think I'd caught up to it until years later. Every reaction that a woman has had to Agent 99 in terms of her having some kind of beneficial influence on her life um, is so satisfying. But I always have to say, you know, I didn't write it. I just showed up and put on that great wardrobe <laughs> and acted it. But I did not conceive that character. And that's why Get Smart really is a writer's show. I mean, in every sense, the rest of us, the, all of the actors, and that's not to, that's not to be self-effacing about what we could bring to it because we were skilled at what we did, but that we've done many, many other things that did not register with the public the way the characteristics of these characters did. And uh, that's because they weren't written by the same people. Well, I, I don't think Agent 99 was written for me. I know that I was offered it once they looked at what the character was. They had already seen me do a spy on another talent associate show on Mr. Broadway, and I played an industrial spy. And uh, Alan Shane, who was casting for Get Smart and casting for generally for talent associate shows, um, I think probably suggested me, and a lot of them had seen me you know, do this character in another context. So they had that in their heads, and uh, so that made it very, very easy for me, because <laughs> I'd already done the role. Um, but I, it, it, I'm quite sure it wasn't written, written for me, but I, I'm very, very grateful that they um, got the idea to use me. That was probably one of the most fortunate things in my life. Even today, when I go out on the street, I don't think a week goes by that somebody doesn't yell, yo, 99. <laughs> it's been just a, such a sweet thing that has been laid on my life. I, I, I could never complain about the fact that I was indelibly in the minds of people as Agent 99, and that's how they would forever think of me. I think that um, it was one of the, one of the great pieces of good fortune in my life. And if it limited me in terms of being cast in other things, which undoubtedly it did, I would be willing to pay that price again. When I was doing Get Smart, and when I was presenting this character who became a role model for a lot of little girls who cut their hair in bangs and wanted to be strong and smart and bold like Agent 99, I was not really in my personal life uh, quite as evolved as Agent 99 was. I was playing a character that was really beyond, in a funny way, considering that she was a cartoon character, basically, beyond where I had developed. And later on in life, I did become that. I did become uh, more independent and more self-sufficient and more, uh, had more equilibrium in life than at the time I was playing the role. So in a funny way, you could almost say that Agent 99 became a role model for the actress who was playing her. The wardrobe came out of the time. If that show were done today, the wardrobe probably wouldn't be quite as startling, maybe because so much of the wardrobe today is startling. But at that time, Rudy Gernreich was, uh, was um, designing, and I was wearing a lot of his clothes. And I had been a model, so I was very uh, aware of what fashion was, and I knew what I liked to wear, and I, I enjoyed wearing uh, clothes that were you know, uh, a little on the cutting edge. So when we did get smart, we, we wore a lot of my clothes. 
and also the designers who I liked, you know, to wear, like Rudy and uh, Cappy Capriati, who had a, the general store in Beverly Hills. So I had a free ride in terms of wardrobe for about five years because I got to wear everything I love to wear on uh, Get Smart. And then I actually got to keep all the clothes. So I was, I was a little shocked later on when I had to start buying clothes for myself and thought, oh, wow, <laughs> this is expensive. I think at the time Get Smart was made, uh, fashion was very much in the foreground. It hadn't sort of disintegrated into everything, you know. Today, anything goes. If you go to the opera, the theater, wherever you go, you'll see everything. Then you didn't. It, we had come out of the 50s. We were just into the 60s, so we still had all of that conventional wardrobe that we wore. And this was such a shocking, the mod clothes, such a shocking departure from that, that it caught everyone's attention and their imagination. And it was much more playful and uh, fun, I think, to wear them. It wasn't taken for granted as much as it is today that you can wear things that are, you know, uh, very imaginative or, you know, out of the ordinary. Uh, during the five years that we did Get Smart, uh, Agent 99's character uh, changed as I changed in life. At the beginning of the show, I was a little intimidated by the whole experience. I hadn't done that much television. I was uh, I extremely obedient. You know, I, I didn't want to make waves. I wanted everyone to be happy, and I wanted everyone to be happy with me. I think as the show went on and I got more confident, not only on the set, because I knew everyone and it became this family and very accepting environment, but also in my own life, where I had worked very hard on growing up and uh, getting past some of the things that would make me behave in a very socially acceptable way, but maybe not in a totally appropriate way, vis-a-vis um, -vis other people, for example, you know, being sort of too nice, that kind of thing, that as I began to feel more comfortable in life and began to feel my own sense of development and, um, and empowerment, if you will, uh, I think that showed up in Agent 99's character. The, the earliest episodes, I think you'll find her being a, a, a little more consciously accommodating, a little more trepidatious, I, and later on, just a little more headstrong. I think that, that Don had a sort of innate swagger about him that was looking for an outlet through a character. And I think that's very charmingly male, in a way. Uh, Agent 99 uh, liked to deal with things the way I like to deal with things, which is more through diplomacy than actual physical violence. And although they, they tried and tried for the first season to have Agent 99 engaged in some kind of karate episode, and they would laugh and say that, that her arm would go up by the time it hit the guy's neck. It was like a feather. It would just like <laughs> kind of float down his neck. And finally, they, they took away from me all of these, um, you know, these exercises of, uh, of, of physical prowess. And um, I was a little embarrassed by the fact that it was a joke that I, I, I simply couldn't, I, I couldn't muster, you know, the, uh, the requisite kind of... <laughs> Agent 99 could never, quite, could never quite get in touch with her inner macho. Apropos Agent 99's propensity or not to be violent on screen, I, I was always very admiring of Diana Rigg, who did the Avengers in England, because she was tough. I mean, she didn't smile all the time like Agent 99 did. You know, she wasn't trying to ingratiate herself all the time. And uh, I mean, she just did the job. And uh, she was my role model in a way. I never quite accomplished it. But of course, she also had a, a, a her partner was a bit softer than than Max was. I mean, it, that was a, it was a little different uh, person to negotiate than, than uh, Maxwell Smart.
Apropos of the actress behind Agent 99 being unwilling to confront violence, uh, one day we were shooting a show. It was probably in, it must have been the third or fourth year. And we were shooting outside on location. We were on a cliff. And Don suddenly got inspired and said to the director, why don't Agent 99 and Max just jump off this cliff and, and it, was, it was almost precipitous, I mean, going, and I, that would, you could get from below and it'd be this great shot, and, and I'm listening to this and still, you know, not saying anything. And it, so he said, this is going to work, Barbara. He said, I was in the Marines, and he said, I'm going to go over first, and then you go over second, and as I slide down this incline, I'm going to break you know, sort of break your fall so that you will always be behind me and I'll slow it down and everything and everything's going to be fine. <laughs> and so they said action and I took a deep breath. Don went over, then I jumped over and I skidded right past him. It just it, it went to the bottom of this gravel. I was totally scratched. I was in tears when I ended up at the bottom. And it, yes, he did go slower. It's just that I went faster. <laughs> it wasn't one of my favorite experiences. And the, the, of course, the, the awful thing was that when they looked at it in the dailies, because of the angle of the camera looking right up and you're coming toward the camera, you had no sense of the steepness. It looked just like it was a little hill because it was foreshortened. Don would try anything. He, re he really was, he was game for any of that. I, I think a lot of male actors are like that that the, a part of it, like doing cowboy movies and everything, it's riding the horse and it's falling in the dust and doing all of that. And girls are not inclined to, you know, put that at the top of the list. When I signed to do Agent 99, I thought, well, what are the things they're going to want me to do? Uh, and I thought, maybe I'm going to have to ride a horse. So I went over to Claremont uh, Stables here in Manhattan. And I took some horseback riding lessons just to, to brush up on something I'd done as a teenager. When I was about 15, I would go riding every morning. So that's where I, that's where I got my skills. During Get Smart, we were wet so much of the time. We were drowned in a phone booth. We were washed over by water on a ship. We were in ponds and lakes and waterfalls. We were in a car wash with the top down. I, I think of the greatest discomfort of doing the show was being wet. You know, I feel like a cat, you know, <laughs> who gets its paw wet and you're always going like this. The memory I have of being in the phone booth was that not so much that it was scary. We couldn't get out. I mean, it didn't have a door. It was just a, a long glass cylinder. And I'm a pretty good swimmer, so I knew I wasn't going to drown. But as we were climbing out of it, when they drained it out, they put a ladder in so we could climb out of it, some water splashed onto a light, a big light, and it exploded. And that was one of those kind of potentially really dangerous accidents that can happen when you're doing the show. You know, I never watched television very much, so I wasn't that aware of what the other situation comedies were. I, I, I do know in retrospect that they were pretty much domestic, but I, I, I just took it for granted what we did was what we did. I'd never done a series before. I mean, I, I went into the thing totally blindly, like an innocent, and, and people were saying, what is the rating, the rating is this, the rating is that, and so forth, and I didn't even know what a rating was. I was just doing a job. So I never really compared us to any of the other shows, I, and they were shows that I didn't watch anyway, so I had just never gotten the TV habit. We were in a very inept environment in a control headquarters, but the chief was, uh, had some gravitas, I thought, and Agent 99 showed some, some modicum of sensibility. Then from then on, as they went down, now her, name, her number was 99, so she was the top, right? She was the top agent. As they went down the list, 86, and the other agents, I think that um, their rankings said something about their abilities. 
I think that the show came out of, uh, out of its times. I mean, at that time, we were very aware of the CIA. It was the Cold War. We were very aware of the KGB. And I think that one agency was probably fascinated with the other, and I think that showed up in Get Smart, too. Uh, I was recently invited down to Langley to the CIA where they were having an exhibit of KGB death instruments, you know, spy equipment and so forth. And so there, they're, they're putting it almost in their museum, the, the other side's, you know, um, uh, uh, equipment. And they also had, adjacent to that exhibit, they had an exhibit of all of the um, the spy shows, Get Smart, they had the shoe phone and, you know, some of our, our little trinkets, and um, 007 and so forth. That, yes, I think there's, there's a mutual admiration going on among the forces of good and evil. So uh, whether that was deliberately tapped into by Buck uh, is... Uh, anybody's guess. Maybe he doesn't even know. I did a commercial for Revlon, uh, Lying on a Tiger Skin Road, uh, sort of aimed at all you tigers out there when she growls and rolls around in this rug. Uh, that had been conceived by um, uh, Gray Advertising and I, at the behest of Mr. Revson, who had seen me on another commercial where I was actually rolled up in a rug <laughs> and then unrolled. And he was looking at that time for a, a young image for a product of theirs called Top Brass Hairdressing. So they hired an outside guy to write a few commercials and do a test, and they did it like a screen test. And that was the one that tested the highest, and they put me under contract. And I was still under contract to them when I began doing Get Smart and uh, continued working for Revlon for a couple of years into Get Smart. I almost lost Agent 99 in about the second week of shooting the show because I had done a deodorant commercial for Revlon six months prior to doing the show. And the sponsor of the show had a deodorant soap and thought that that was a conflict of interest. And uh, to Revlon's credit, they just uh, did everything they could to talk the sponsor out of firing me. And uh, they signed papers saying they would never use me for a deodorant again, and, uh, and that a deodorant is not a deodorant soap. That's an entirely different thing. And there was a day when NBC was coming down to the set to actually take me off the set because the sponsor was insisting on it. And I have no idea what turned it around. I don't know who got to whom. And finally they relented and said, it's okay, she can, she can continue playing the role. Uh, the, the other thing that would limit my role was, was, uh, was my condition, that I would not sign a five-year contract because I thought I would be ancient by the time <laughs> the contract was up. So I turned down the role of, gets, of uh, Agent 99 I, it, because of that. I didn't want to move to California, and I didn't want to sign for five years. So they said, you can sign for two years, and you don't have to do all the episodes. So they took me out of two or three episodes the first year. And of course, by the time the two years was up, I was not about to relinquish my number to somebody else. And in fact, the episodes I was not in, they put in someone else. And of course, I was very unhappy about it. But that was something that I had insisted in, in having in the contract. Agent 99 got very jealous when there was another woman. And you, and you do, even as an actor, it's so funny because you know, you know it's not real life. But I, I, was, I, I didn't love it when he was doing, you know, scenes with other women. And um, that was a little bit of 99 rubbing off on me, I think. <laughs>